Hello, people. Welcome to your weekly dose of you culture. It can only be what's up. She's Jacqueline. And that is Fusion. And not only is it another great episode that we've got lined up for you, but it's also the final episode of the series. The highs of chilling in the VIP. The lows are not meeting our audience, so I'm going to let you off on that one. It's only appropriate we bring you this episode from a place called Bittersweet. Yes, very apt. Very apt. So what's coming up on the show? Well, our girl Michelle meets up with a very funny comedian, Reginald D. Hunter, and Ramel absolutely smashes it at hip-hop karaoke. That's right, and you better stick around after the break because we're going to drop some hip-hop science with the likes of Professor Green. Yes, but first up, we're going to meet a young R&B and soul singer-songwriter, and she goes by the name of Kyra. Hey, what's up? It's Ramel London, and I'm joined by the lovely, lovely Kyra. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Good, good, good. So obviously, we homegirls. I know all about you. <laughs> but for those who don't know about you, tell us a little bit about your style of music and your vibe. Well, I guess I call it um, soul pop, really, okay. what I do. Obviously, Good Love was quite like a summery yes. feel, a bit of R&B influence in there. But yeah, you know, just my music's drawn from a lot of influences, but definitely a soulful root. One of my songs that I performed um, at a show that you know of is called I Hate My Job. Oh, yes. And that, that <laughs> literally came from me hating my job. Actually, I was working as a receptionist, um, waking up 6 a.m., and I hated life. I hate my job, yeah, I really hate it. So you've worked with so many different people, been on tour with loads of different people. Yeah, I had the privilege of opening up for Rita Ora oh, at the O2. That's amazing. Um, obviously supporting Wretch 32 on tour was amazing. Um, meeting Labyrinth, you know, Tiny Temper, a lot of people in the industry that I respect. Is there any hot gossip, you know, anything that goes on backstage? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be telling. <laughs> what happens on tour stays on tour. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, they're, they're cool people and I love seeing the world, so yeah. got a little tan. And the way you are glowing, <laughs> like, I'm getting a tan from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been nice. You need a little bit of sun. I know you're doing so well and it's lovely to see that you're getting paid for your passion. Have you got any tips on how to get into the music industry? Just start doing what you love. Obviously, YouTube is an amazing platform That's now so to put yourself out there. So um, I've got my monthly series, You Say It, I Sing It. Always try to put material out there, network, and just seize every opportunity, I say. You know, if you're pursuing a creative a talent, you don't necessarily have to do well in the UK. You know, you can go off to Japan, to France, wherever. Yeah. So it's, it's good to know that the horizon's kind of there, and it's there for the taking, really. So you mentioned your feature on your YouTube channel, You Say It, I Sing It. Tell me how that works, sounds fun. Every month I let the public give me a song to sing and I'll do a mashup of it. So I get together with my Kyrettes, my oh, band. I love that. We jam, I cook them lunch. Okay, well, how do I become a Kyrette? <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Just declare it on Twitter. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, so we jam and then we record it and, and put it up there. So um, anyone's welcome to kind of give me some suggestions of what they'd like to hear. Definitely, guys, if you want to suggest uh, you say it, you sing it for the lovely Kyra, hit us up on the Twitter, what's up youth? It's that simple. And we'll send them over to you. Yeah, definitely. That'll be fun. Pick a good one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Tried everything, but you won't give. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been Kyra, Merle London. What's up? Are you in your 20s, but you feel suffocated by your job or maybe even your relationship? Perhaps you're constantly craving change and want to do something crazy. Maybe you're always comparing yourself to your friends. Now, if that sounds like you, the chances are you're going through a quarter-life crisis. Have you heard of a quarter-life crisis? Not before today. Yeah, I have. No, I haven't. What do you describe your idea of a quarter-life crisis to be? Um, I would say just feeling that you're not exactly where you want to be, um, rushing to get there. It seemed like a midlife crisis, but when you're in your 20s, yeah. so obviously, <laughs> yeah. you're kind of thinking, I'm getting old now, I don't know what to do in my life. Now I'm joined by an expert, Dr. Oliver Robinson, who's done some research into this new phenomenon. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Hello. And tell us then what your research found the main symptoms of course life crisis to be. 
Well, um, firstly, I wouldn't call them symptoms okay. because that would suggest that there's something clinically wrong with you if you've got <laughs> symptoms, whereas this is quite a normal experience. Yeah. But the typical features of quarter life crisis are firstly that a person finds themselves in a situation in their, well, usually in, the, in their mid-twenties, but it can happen a bit earlier, it can happen a bit later, where they feel that something about their life situation is problematic. The main causes are uh, being in your mid-twenties or a bit younger or a little bit older than that and uh, making decisions that you then come to realise aren't the right decisions for you in the long term. Dealing with like growing old and <laughs> what they're going to do the rest of their life. Coming out of university you kind of go into a bit of a lull, a bit mm -hmm. of depression. Um, trying to get a job can be quite difficult. There's like a behavioural thing about when someone's presented with too many options yeah. they don't they don't actually pick anything. So what would your advice be to them to overcome their quarter life crisis? Don't be afraid of change, but don't be afraid to take time out and experiment. Don't feel you've got to jump straight into something new. I went to see counsellor and therapist Patrick Shepherd to see what his take is on the quarter life crisis. Do you think it's an actual crisis? I do, yes. I mean, throughout human history, people have found it difficult to move from being a teenager to being an adult. Do you think that people who are perhaps more privileged go through more of a quarter-life crisis than those that aren't as privileged? I do, uh, very much so. And I think that that is the, the rich child's problem, really, I've seen, is too much choice. And just generally recognising that the elite is the elite, and it always has been, and they tend to look after themselves, but the debate is also uh, put forward by them. They, yeah. they dictate the terms of the debate. It has to be reframed so that most people's ordinary lives are seen as much more precious and that's where the opportunities have to be. If you actually broadened out the opportunities to more people and there was more access to, to everyone, those less privileged as well, um, that actually more people would be suffering from a quarter life crisis. Youth unemployment, in, it's 60% in Greece, it's 55% in Spain, it's 20% here. There is a very real change, which is there's more, much more competition, and the competition is fiercer, uh, and the sense of people in the world is more fluid and changing, and you know, it's now a global village. If something happens in the UK, it can go around the world in a heartbeat. So whether you think it's an actual quarter-life crisis or maybe just a rite of passage, the word of the day seems to be relax. If you talk it through, you're likely to be just fine. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, quarter-life crisis. I've been through it. Okay. You've been through it. Mm -hmm. But I like your advice on the clip. You know, no idea persevering. Forward. Absolutely. And this is you not talking about it. You know, I'd rather just talk about Kyra, to be honest. Yeah, Kyra, she was brilliant. It actually got back to me that the crew pretty much fell in love with her, as did I, and I think you did too. What's there not to love about Kyra? I mean, I've known her from days, so I, like, I feel like I'm the original Kyra. Okay, you know, so. I'm going to claim that too. I am now a Kyra. If you feel like you are as well, and you would like to request a track on You Say It, I Sing It, then as Ramel said, don't forget just to tweet us. That's her thing. You're, you're going to sing it as well? Not me, Kyra. Anyway. I'm looking forward to the next guy, the next one that's coming up. Yes, this gentleman is so, so funny. He reigns from America. He's a comedian on all of the panel shows over here. He is awesome. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, like, we are the awesome ones, because that's why he's always in this country. He is. In fact, someone needs to check his passport. <laughs> I don't know, he's always here. <laughs> I've got the fabulous, one and only, Reginald D. Hunter yes, on What's Up. How y'all doing? How all you right. feeling? I'm feeling very well. Thank you for asking. Oh, you're welcome. So tell me a bit about your show that you've got doing at the moment. Oh, uh, that's what we're going to talk about? Yes. Oh, that thing. Plus many other things. Um, uh, it is a stand-up comedy show. Um, it uh, has a lot to do with being in the midst of battling your sanity. Okay. Uh, in the midst of uh, British Christmas celebrations. And um, uh, being around white people as well, in a particular way. Um, it's, uh, it's trying to separate the difference between being racist and racial. And um, everything is racial. A lot of things are racial. Like, if I was white and you was talking to me, then all of a sudden the situation is racial. But it's not racist. My family and friends, you know, when I got there, first thing they do, especially the ones that ain't seen me in a long while, first thing they want to do is ask me about Britain. Uh-huh. First question. A lot of white people? I bet it's a lot of white people over there. A lot of white people. I bet it's a lot of white people. A lot of white people. And I say, man, this is where they make white people, man. <laughs> it's like white people's Africa. What? 
What made you touch up on that subject? Um, I don't really like talking about mm. racism. Mm. Um, but I do find that in this country, white people can be a little too self-congratulatory about being over it or above it. And anytime someone says to you, well, I just hope they don't go on about race, mm. then that's someone that doesn't understand what it's like to be standing next to someone and that person be incensed that you exist. When I was 14, I got mixed up in something that's very dangerous for any teenager to get mixed up in in the Deep South. I got mixed up in sarcasm. <laughs> I'm going to use one of your quotes now. You've been doing stand up for a strong minute now. <laughs> I never say that. <laughs> I never say things like that. You're thinking of Junior Simpson, Stephen Gamers, Levi Root. I never say things no, like that. <laughs> I'm talking of you. I decided that I'm not going to get into any situation until I am asked. And consequently, I'm not dating. I thought it was going to be a life change, but it turns out it's going to be more of a phase. <laughs> Recently, you mentioned that you started dating again. It's like over here, uh, it took me a while to realize that when a woman over here says, I'm fine, she isn't. <laughs> I, I, I took about three or four relationships to go, <laughs> oh, that means something different. <laughs> that means the opposite. Oh my God, I got some apologies to make. <laughs> That's it, man. Well, on that note, <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for coming yes, on What's Up. It's been, it's been fantastic talking to you and Likewise, getting to know man. you a bit more. <laughs> and all the best for the future and the rest of your show. Thank you, sure. Right. Bye. Reginald D. Hunter. Get out of here, you <laughs> crazy kids. Get out of here. <laughs> Oh, he was really cute. I particularly like the way he said yes, ma'am, all the time to Michelle. Oh. Girls are still suckers for American accents, I swear. But he's cool. He does his thing. He's deep, charismatic, funny. Kind of like someone we both know. And that is... Guys, if you want to find out more about Reginald D. Hunter, all you have to do is check out What's Up Extra. Now, I'm ready for a break, because I know what's coming up next. Yes, yes, we definitely need to take a break before that. Make sure you don't go anywhere, because you will not want to miss this. So I'm not smooth. Welcome back. Still to come, one of the UK's most talented rappers, Professor Green. And Scooby is pipped with a powerful spoken word piece filmed exclusively for What's Up. Now, are you ready for some fun? What kind of fun? Karaoke fun. OK, sell it to me. <laughs> OK, imagine <laughs> going on a night out, mm. listening to all your favourite hip hop tracks, mm. and you get to go on the mic, spit some bars, all to an adoring audience. Are you just making this up? What are you talking about? Hip hop karaoke. Hip hop karaoke, Ramel told me about this. I'm down. Yeah, this is good. Mm -hmm. Yo, DJ, run the track. Oh, yeah. I made it. Shout out to you, fans. I love you. Let's do it. Go, Ramel. Go, Ramel. Oh, 
sorry. Hey, what's up? It's from Royal London, and I am here at The Social. Now, every Thursday, yes, every Thursday, there's a big event. Hip hop karaoke. I'm so gassed, because not only do I like karaoke, but I'm passionate about hip hop. So I'm going to give you my beats and my bars, throw it down. Do you know what? Let's check it out. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Something pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Hanging pictures on my wall. In hip hop karaoke, we try and make it a place where everyone can come, whether you have one rap CD or you have every rap CD that's ever existed. It's not an open mic, so there's no pressure to do anything but your best and just enjoy yourself. And it's just a great time. You know, the energy is fantastic. People are always encouraged to be positive. There's no booing, there's no hating. It's just a place where you can party, let yourself go and feel like a rapper, you know. Genuinely feel like what a rapper must feel like I'm for excited. three minutes on a Thursday night. I'm really excited. I'm ready. I'm going to give it my all. Yep. We're ready for you. Let's go crazy on a Thursday night! <laughs> just come off stage at hip-hop karaoke this woman actually saved me what's your name my name is Habban you can call me Habs are you a regular at hip-hop karaoke yes I've been coming here for a year and a half now I come here quite often just to chill out and vibe out it's an absolutely amazing vibe you won't believe it what brings you down here it's a lovely club we want a good night I had an absolutely amazing time tonight at a social for hip-hop karaoke I'm not gonna lie I think I smacked it even though I didn't know the words but remember guys dreams can become a reality. Make sure you come down every Thursday, Hip Hop Karaoke. Yes, big up Ramel London. We love her as a presenter, but she might have a future as an MC, I like. Yeah, maybe. And she was so brave going up there without knowing any of the lyrics. Crowd were loving it. Energy was like. Yeah, loved it. So, next up, Fusion, do you want to introduce this one? I would love to introduce him. Okay, I've known about this guy from back in the day when he was making his name on the battle circuit, on Jump Off, but he's gone on to win a mobile award. He's collaborated with Lily Allen, Labyrinth, and Emily Sande. He and already has two top three albums and eight chart topping singles under his belt. He is the one, the Professor only. Green. I thought I was introducing him. Okay. Professor Green, check him out. Professor Green. <laughs> What's up? It's your girl Michelle and I'm here with the one and only Mr. Integrity himself, Professor Green. How you doing? I'm good, you alright? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. I'm Mr. Very well. Integrity, yes. that's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> you clearly don't know me that well. <laughs> For me, firstly the title growing up in public just come from I mean, it's there's a little bit of irony. I'm at a point in my life where it feels somewhat transitional. There's a whole lot of adult and, you know, that kind of adult things going on. Um, but at the same time, in other aspects, I'm holding on to my youth. You know, I'm still a little bit of a reprobate every now and again. Um, and all of this is happening in, in the public eye. And how do you find that? Um, I just think you have to have good people around you. You know, we, we don't have that much to complain about in what we do because we essentially do our hobbies as a job. It's not, it's not really work. I think people need to remember how fortunate they are. Having this tattoo, the world on your neck, you must count yourself quite lucky. Yeah, I guess that was, it was, I, I was always quite pessimistic. Something which I've been trying to correct gradually my whole life. And just to look at things a little bit differently, that was the significance of the tattoo. Do you think that's the key to your success, having this positive attitude that you've got? It's either that or, or, or the persistence and the blind stupidity. <laughs> you know, you have to be some kind of idiot to work for as long as I did towards something for not a penny. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that people who want to, to, to do well in music or media don't understand is, is the disappointment that yeah. you have to suffer along the way. 
um, and the letdowns. Yeah, and because you spoke about, you know, previously, you think your fans want to hear like integrity in your music. Do you think you can still maintain that? Yeah, because I think people, the, the whole being real gets thrown about all the time. And what is being real but being honest? People automatically think that being real means you have to still be on the roads and. Or should I still be hanging about in my, my flats, like in the swing park, doing what? It's, that's not that's not where I'm at, so that's not real to me anymore. There's a certain stigma attached to rap and hip hop that doesn't exist elsewhere. That you have to be hard, and you have to have done this and done that, and been through this and been through that, and. I think the only way to really stick around as an artist is to make good music. It's not about what's in your past. It's not about what's in your future. It's about what's in the songs that you write. It's a perception, like a lot of young people think, you know, being famous or getting into the limelight is the only yeah. route they can take the answer to all their prayers. What yeah. advice would you give to them? Um, look beyond that. If you really want it, then work for it, but don't expect, expect things to land in your lap because nothing does. This wasn't luck or or, you know, me knowing the right person and just having this one handed to me, this was me working my backside off of it. Um, but there's so many other positions that people aren't aware of and I wasn't aware of growing up. The first festival I ever went to was when I was working. You know, I'd never, never seen anything like it. And, you know, there's so many other jobs and so many other things you can do, but it's difficult because Kids at school are not necessarily encouraged to focus on their strengths. They're encouraged to pass the same tests that everyone has to sit, and everyone's strengths are not the same. Some people are academic, some are not. I was really academic as a kid. I stopped going to school in year eight because as smart as I was, I was too stupid to carry on. And I was allowed to make decisions for myself that I shouldn't have been making at that age. Um, but, uh, you know, you could have put me in training to become any kind of athlete for my entire life, and it never would have worked. I never would have been successful because that's not my strengths. Um, mine are in my, my words and my voice. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much for joining us on What's Up. What a nice guy Professor Green was. I think he's the most charming man in hip-hop, actually. And in fact, I'm really looking forward to that single coming soon. Remember, the album dropped in November and it's sure to be a stocking filler for you What's Up fans out there. Yes, it will be. But that is it for now. We have reached the end of the series. But don't you worry, you can follow us on Twitter and you can go on our website. We're constantly updating events throughout the year until we return next year for season five. In fact, you need to take it old school. Check out the previous series, the last of jokes, the fun, and all the things in between. Now, as ever, we love to end the show with a meaningful ending, and this is no exception. This time it's brought to you by Scooby's Pip, an amazing spoken word artist who touches on the subject of suicide and self-harm. The message is very simple. Your life matters to the people around you, and if you need help, it's out there for you. Yeah, if you're affected by any of the themes that you hear, do have a look on our website for further information. It's tragic. You tried to cut yourself in half, but this ain't magic. In fact, it's something far more dark and more dramatic. Self-harm, that's what they call it, because it just affects you. It's your life, your body, so you can choose what you do. And if one day you can't rein it in and of your last breath you are the only witness, then so be it, because it's your last breath and it's nobody else's business. But then, what about little sister? I mean, God knows your life's been bad. And by no means am I belittling that, because I know the troubles you've had, but a teen finding out a big sister chose death over life. Finding out that instead of turning to her of your problems, you turn to a knife. That's a whole lot of pain to deal with, and a whole lot of damage. And the only role model she has now is little more than words engraved in granite, but as you said before, this just affects you. It's your life, your body, so you can choose what you do. And if one day you can't rein it in and of your last breath you are the only witness, then so be it, because it's your last breath and it's nobody else's business. But then, well, what about your parents? God knows they've done all they can to support. Yeah, you didn't grow up in a mansion, but they gave you the best life they could afford. And the moment that last bit of life trickles out and your lungs cease to breathe, they have failed the most important task that they will ever receive. They have failed to give their child a life that's worth living. And that's a failure that, as long as they live of themselves, is unforgiving. But, as you said before, this just affects you. It's your life, your body, so you can choose what you do. 
And if one day you can't rein it in and of your last breath you are the only witness, then so be it, because it's your last breath and it's nobody else's business. So then, oh, what about me? Oh, what kind of boyfriend am I? Instead of living a life I was a big part of, you would rather die. Instead of fighting through together and turning things around, decided the grass was greener on the other side of the ground. Of our shared lives, there was nothing worth living for as far as you could see, so if that's the case for you, what is there left in this life for me? But as you said before, this just affects you. It's your life, your body, your sister, your parents, your friends and your partner, so you can choose what you do. And if one day you can't rein it in and of your last breath you are the only witness, then forget everybody else. Because that ain't something that you've got to live with. The magician's assistant. <laughs>